Don't you realize this island is only for ducks? Chirp said, what do you mean? She's not a duck. Yes, I am, said Peep. Nonsense. She's a chicken. Poor Peep asked, what's a chicken? <laughs> So welcome back to part two of this fantabulous series we're calling NFB November. If you're coming from part one or the intro, you waited all the way for little old me to drop this new installment, I have to say thank you. If you don't have any idea what's going on, watch the intro. It's four minutes, it'll clue you into everything you need to know, and it's pretty informative. Uh, Last episode was pretty great, fantastic, monumental, as Nebel would say, brontosaurus. But it's time to move on, and today we're going to be talking about the works of Kai Pindle. So strap in, because it's time to jump into it. Before we get into the film's prior, I want to give some, some background on this man, this myth, this legend. Kai Pindle was a Danish animator who got his start uh, making World War II propaganda films, and uh, after he came out of hiding, he worked on some extra films for the local military. Uh, the NFB picked up on these films, invited him to come work on some in the late 50s, and the rest is pretty much history. It's a long, long filmography, but we only have time to tackle five films today, so... These are uh, some of the best, not all of them, but some of the best work he's ever put out. Back on Green Island, Chirp wondered if Peep and Quack had forgotten him. Just then he sighted the log coming. Oh no, they're bringing a cat. Don't they know cats are trouble for birds? Help, 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 help! Hurry, Peep shouted. I think Chirp is in danger. Yes, Quack, hurry, Tom added. The first one here is probably one that you'll be very familiar with. One that has a lot of, a lot of spunk, a lot of energy. It's called Peep. Peep was one of Kai's earliest ideas. It started as a 1962 black and white uh, limited animation short that was narrated entirely by the one and only Peter Ustinov, and it was remade into a trilogy of short films sometime in the late 80s, and that went on to spawn the 2004 PBS series Peep and the Big Wide World. Now, if you're not familiar with this story, it's actually pretty simple. See, there's this little chicken, as round as can be, called Peep, who makes friends with this robin, Chirp, and this duck quack, and together they just explore the world around them as young, impressionable creatures as they learn about, you know, weather and other animals and just how this world works. So, uh, I wanted to talk about the trilogy of films. Uh, the black and white film is essentially a pilot to the first film. It was just remade. There's uh, not much extra content slapped onto it, but the trilogy itself is built around discovery and adventure, which is partially the reason why the PBS series is the way it is. You know, it's focused on science and environmental studies, so that, that concept is very beautifully dovetailed off with this series. And the trilogy itself takes on a very impressionable tone. So the tone of the show and the trilogy of films itself is very naive, but also it has a bit of dry wit to it. You know, it, it, it very much embodies the tone of Peep himself, who is optimistic, wide-eyed, yet not entirely reckless or just rearing to get out there. The way that the film was narrated initially makes for a very interesting commentary to be had within it, uh, but not overly saccharine or anything. Like, it, it, this is obviously a, 
a character and a world made for younger children, but it doesn't necessarily alienate you from that, which, I, you know, you can appreciate nowadays. Uh, doesn't skimp. It's just very simple, but very real set of characters put into this world, and they're just, uh, they're just entertaining. So before I talk about this entry, I just want to issue a little disclaimer, a little content warning. Uh, this film um, can be pretty upsetting, and um, it involves a lot of serious stuff. Child death, sexual abuse, and um, 4chan memes. So, if you're sensitive to any of those issues, like why wouldn't you be, um, please skip to this timestamp. The last thing I would want for y'all is to be traumatized by content shown in this video. And uh, I don't want you to go through what I did when watching this one. So, uh, proceed at your own risk. Past this point. Proceed with caution. And, uh, yeah. One day, <gasps> Dingo Dog saw someone. A girl who was juggling hoops. He ran over to her. <laughs> Her name was Maria. So, Kai Pindle spent much of his career working on film made as public service announcements. In fact, most of the entries in this video are comprised of some type of educational content. And this next film is no exception. I was originally planning to cover the films chronologically, but given that these first two are perhaps the most exciting of the whole bunch, I decided we need to get them out of the way first. Not like the next three are not as exciting, but you know what, these two are just like night and day. So, I, I hesitate to even talk about this one, but it would be disrespectful not to, considering that he himself felt that these were like part of his strongest body of work, so away we go. Karate Kids is a 1990 animated film made to teach street kids around the world about sexual health in the midst of the AIDS epidemic. It was an ambitious and well-researched project for its time, but not a particularly well-polished or slick one at that. Every part of this film was made to be the most palatable to kids in developing countries, possibly at the risk of alienating other demographics. There are two documentaries that explain the process really well, but uh, the main story of how it came to be is pretty cut and dry. See, there was this young NGO in Canada that uh, was doing research on street kids and uh, realized that a lot of them were vulnerable to AIDS, and a lot of them couldn't get all the basic facts because a lot of them were illiterate or only semi-literate. Uh, but they seem to like Tom and Jerry, so uh, why don't we just put all this stuff in a cartoon? Which is where the NFB comes in, you know, Kai Pindle and another amazing director, Derek Lamb, go and do pre-production in South America. They see some things, have their lives changed forever, and they go back to work on the film, create a Leica, screen it, get notes, revise it, and then a few months later, the cartoon is finished. The main story follows these two kids and their adventures around the local marketplace as they come to learn about AIDS, how to avoid contracting it, and how to protect themselves in the future. I don't feel like I can say more than that without it spoiling the whole story. So that's exactly what I'm going to do right now. I'm not doing this just to make your lives easier and make you understand the story better, but I mean... I want you to get a, a, a clear idea of what you're jumping into if you decide to go on this 22 minute journey because, you know, I didn't and I was traumatized. I didn't sleep for two nights because of how raw this film was. And you know what? You gotta learn what it's like right off the bat. If you don't wanna be spoiled and you wanna watch the film and come to discover it by itself, skip to this timestamp and, uh, you will avoid all the spoilers. So there are these two kids, Mario and Pedro, and they go to the market every day to try to make some money. Sometimes they're successful, sometimes not. But eventually, 
they are meeting the quote-unquote smiling men in the black car face to face and he offers them a watch to go with a to go on a ride with them their mentor karate spots them in time and chases this guy off and he explains that this guy wanted to have sex with them and he might have had aids and that was a really bad spot to be in and he explains that aids is dangerous and it will eventually kill you and there's no cure for it so you need to protect yourself uh the next day uh they do earn some money but it gets stolen by some roving crackhead and eventually the smiling man rolls up again and he offers some money Pedro's scared he doesn't go into the car with him but Mario hops in because quote unquote he doesn't care about the AIDS he just wants the money so Pedro goes back to Karate and tells him what happened and uh, they roll up on the, the smiling man kicking Mario out of the car and stealing his money and uh, Karate uh, eventually engages in a high speed chase and he chases him off the edge of a cliff and the smiling man dies in an explosion Everyone grows older a few years later, and um, eventually Mario and Pedro make a lot of money with juggling, which is great. But eventually Mario starts to get sick, and he won't get better again, and everybody's curious as to why, and eventually gets so sick that they can't juggle together anymore, and Karate says that Mario has AIDS. And uh, that night, Karate and his girlfriend explain to the street kids why condoms are great, and why they need to use them every time. And during that lecture, Mario dies. So they have to bury him on a, on a hill at the edge of the town. And Pedro's understandably really sad, really messed up over this. But he meets this other girl that's juggling hoops in the market, and they make a great team. And um, it's kind of like old times, but oh no. He spots another roving, smiling man trying to pick up another group of kids and he slams the car door in on him and presumably rescues the kids. That is the that is the end of the film. That's where it ends off on. This film itself was not an original idea of Kai's, obviously. The story itself was written by Derek Lamb, but it is very much his work in Vogue, you know. He's the main animator, lead character designer, did all that good stuff visually and um, it really is uh, a testament to what he can do because you know his work is pretty distinctive stylistically but there are also really effective ways to like branch out and make it something more which is exactly the kind of impasse you reach here this uh, this film had a sequel called gold tooth and, like, it is the most dramatic thing I've ever seen. I think I'd prefer to discuss that one, but it is not an NFB production, so I, I cannot. But go watch it. It's it's a freaking amazing, dude. But, yeah, I mean, in both of these films, you know, you can really feel his imprint, you know? Not only, like, the comedic timing or, like, the, the round character design, but also, you know, in heavier moments... Everything is there visually. It really is like his 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 thing. It's not really like, you know, his formal idea, but he had as much impact on it as he could. And uh, considering the ups and downs the story takes on, I, I don't really blame him. So, uh, I would say check it out. But like I said, this film is deeply traumatizing. Like, I mean, it's, it's made for children, but it has a content warning slapped on it. So, I mean, <laughs> make your own decisions. I'm not here to, <laughs> I'm not here to recommend this. Uh, but, I mean, if you do watch it, then you are eligible to watch Goldtooth, the sequel. Because if you don't watch that, it, it won't make too much sense. So... You know, if you watch it, you can watch Goldtooth, and I would highly recommend watching Goldtooth. Because that film is a ride. The next film we have to talk about today is the 1967 
work, What on Earth, was co-directed with a Les Drew, and it is a comedic mockumentary uh, made from the point of view of traveling Martians looking inwardly into the culture of Earthlings. Miraculously, they've come to the conclusion that cars are in fact the most superior beings on the planet and have come to study their sociology and whatnot. And they've come to understand them as uh, people of sorts. In inverse, people and animals are like vermin. They're, they're like pests, you know. Uh, but the cars, you know, they almost have a, a structured civilization in their eyes, much to our own. And, you know, we come to discover just how grounded it is. So this one, it's pretty comedic in tone, but it doesn't really have an additional thing to offer. It's, it's the only one here that's not really of educational sustenance, so to speak. But there's a lot to appreciate it. I think stylistically, it is very striking. The movement design is very rhythmic in tone. You know, cars are, of course, very mechanical, very automatic. And to see them being given new life through the perspective of these aliens, it comes out not only in how they are kind of humanized, but also, you know, how they how they appear. Just, you know, the act of cars moving about is given a whole new, like, rhythm, a whole new life. And in addition, it makes the, the energy of the film accelerate so much more. In general, the film is just a, a fun romp. It doesn't uh, intone any kind of special message. It's just kind of there. Again, it, it's a really good piece to study design-wise. But you could say that about any one of these. But this one just stuck out. Because there was nothing... There's nothing to it, really. It's just... It's just funny. And uh, energetic. Not without its merits but it stands out merely as a product of that. So, check it out. It's only nine minutes or so. You'll have a good time. You'll become cultured as a result. So the next film up on our roster would be the 1979 classic, Caninibus. Caninibus is the story of a dog that falls into a job as the local drug-sniffing dog and, of course, you know, slowly descends into madness as, you know, the weed is just too much to handle and eventually ruins his life. Such a cheery story, I know, but uh, you would enjoy it. One of my favorite things about this one is like the soundtrack. Uh, the way it opens up is on this very pithy, like <laughs> upbeat kind of score, uh, juxtaposed over the dog, like manically chasing after a car to get a fix. And it is like one of the best openings I've seen from an NFB cartoon like ever and it is it, like it tells you everything you need to know about this short like in terms of character and how they handle you know establishing that and it's just uh it's just great uh i also appreciate the dream sequences um the coloration really got to stand out i think in, in general the, the music really uh it helps cement the tone and the style that this that this short has because I think without it it would be an entirely different story hands down but uh yeah the, the main message is is all right uh, you know I don't I don't think I'd be against it per se it uh its ending is rather bittersweet in a way but uh, you know of course it's 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 a comedic film, so, you know, you're not too bummed out by the end of it, but it's also like, wow, are you really gonna go there, huh? <laughs> but, uh, anyway, this one is, uh, it's pretty tight, short, sweet, and to the point, and, uh, 
overall just a really fun time probably one of my favorites check it out So the last film I have to talk about today would be the 1968 thriller, King Size. It is a film in a long line of films made, commissioned by the NFB to help combat smoking in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, initially, they were showing pictures of blackened lungs to like young adults. And unsurprisingly, that uh, that didn't really move a lot of people. So they enlisted the help of some of the greatest animators at the time to push out some films. And like the 66 great The Drag, King Size takes up a more sardonic, humorous approach to the whole subject. Basically, it follows this kid uh, caught between, you know his regular world and this imaginary clout of land where everybody smokes and you're kind of punished for not smoking so it intones like the dangers of peer pressure but also of you know taking risks and standing up for your own needs it's a very different feeling piece definitely there's a lot of visual humor that's taken up with it it's very stimulating. Like, just, just down to the look of this thing is uh, just intoxicating. It's, like, mostly a silent cartoon, but it certainly doesn't feel that way because everything in a visual sense is very loud. It's very in-your-face. Uh, of course, to mimic the, the lavish, flashy campaigns of the, the early days. King Size is... Uh, as far as I know, it's it's a classic of sorts. You know, it's it's one of the classic NFB shorts in the library, and there's a lot of history that goes with it, and rightfully so, because it's just so interesting to look at. Like the feel of it uh, is just so out there, and I mean it compares to other PSAs that they made and that time but it's so much more there's 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 more to it in the sense that there's more to to chew on to latch on to you know the boy is almost like a a self-insert of sorts he's supposed to be an identifying hero whatnot and the film itself ends on like a kind of abstract note like the ending is not particularly Grounded, especially to how it it started but you know by the end of it you're just you're just exhausted you're just glad for it to be over you're glad that everyone's safe and everyone's out of harm's way and uh it is it's a film that you know intones a, a real logic to the insanity of it all and it does a very good job of portraying controlled chaos and making it very fun and lively. So, uh, yeah, easily one of the best. The best of the best. Uh, I would highly recommend it. And, uh, yeah, it's definitely one that is unforgettable to me. So, uh, that was week two. Next week, we're gonna be covering some films that were made for the public good, more public service films. Uh, I just really wanted to get this one out of the way because uh, I felt like it was important. But yeah, if I had to recommend any one of these films, it would probably be Caninibus. Uh, or if I had to cheat, it would probably be Goldtooth. But again, you have to get through Karate Kids to get to Goldtooth, and I don't know if I would be up for even recommending that again. Watch it at your own risk. Uh, I won't, definitely won't knock you if you decide to do it, but <sighs> I don't know, man. Uh, that's it. That's all I got. 
hopefully we'll get to part three in a timely fashion uh, until then i will see you next week